I once again welcome you all to editorial analysis of Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 9th of November 2024. Now before getting into the list of articles, I have certain announcements for you. The most awaited UPSC prelims test series 2025 batch 3 is starting on 21st november 2024 we have provided you the registration link in the description you can click the link and you can register for this test apart from this new batch of chakra is starting on 12th november 2024 it is a program exclusively for current affairs so if your weaker part is current affairs you have to enroll for this particular test series the browser for chakra program is provided in the description you can click that and enroll for this particular program in this first article we will be seeing about car governance and in the second article we will be seeing about UNSC and its representation issues and in the third article we will be seeing about new judgment given by our Supreme Court. So without any delay let us get into the article discussion. Now look at this news article. This news article talks about UNDP. Now currently it is in news because UNDP has marked a particular region in Myanmar as a feminine hit area here the article is talking about the rakhine state of uh, myanmar we all know rakhine state is where the minority people muslim people they reside there especially the rohingyas and this place is currently flagged as the feminine hit region by undp so this is what the news article is about so from the main perspective let us learn about unsc which is a very important special organ of united nation where all the decision making is actually happening from the main perspective so without any delay let us get into the article discussion let's start with what is united nation security council see it was established in 1945 under the UN Charter. The primary objective of this particular body is to maintain international peace and security. So the headquarters of this particular organ it is in New York City remember that. Talking about the membership it has five permanent members which includes US, Russia, France, UK and China. Apart from this there are 10 non-permanent members they will be elected every two years. So the total membership of this UNSC is 15. India served as a non-permanent member from 2021 to 2022 and also remember among these 15 member countries the presidency will be rotating every month to each country within this membership. So this is about the basics of UNSC. Now let us see how decision making actually happens. When we talk about decision making the voting is actually favored towards the P5 countries that are the permanent five countries so each member will be having one vote and to pass a particular uh, or to make a particular decision each member has to put their vote and a majority of nine votes meaning decision will be passed when none of the p5 members has vetoed the resolution only then this decision making will happen in the unsc so this means that even when one per P5 country, if they vote or they veto the resolution, then the entire decision making of that particular thing will be stopped. So this is how the voting and decision making actually happens in UNSC. When we talk about India's role in UNSC, India has actually participated actively in UNSC, especially through contributing a lot of peacekeeping missions, human rights, and we have made a lot of ad advocacy too make this decision making and voting process more inclusive. We have even pushed for permanent seat in UNSC. We have asked this based on our population, GDP, cultural legacy and global contributions. So from this basic information itself, we know what are all certain issues that are currently with UNSC. The first thing is underrepresentation, meaning a lot of uh, Latin American people, even the African people, they are very underrepresented in the particular forum. Secondly, there is a lack of transparency because there is no record keeping of all the decisions that is happening in the UNSC, which implies that there is a lack of transparency. Apart from this, there is division among P5 members itself. There is a polarization within this P5 members itself. So whenever a decision, important decision making, making is happening, they just veto it against their opponent within the P5 country itself. So this is actually hindering a lot of positive decision making. So the other issue is this uh, veto power which we saw just now. So these are all certain issues with the UNSC decision making and the membership. 
now let us quickly go through the UNSC reform proposals. Our India has actually made a G4 proposal for reforming this UNSC. Let us see them what is it one by one. See the first proposal is to expand the permanent membership by adding India, Brazil, Germany and Japan and a lot of underrepresented or unrepresented countries in the world. Secondly to abolish or restrict or limit the veto power. So we have to bring in a proper check and balance in order to make a proper and transparent decision making. Thirdly, we have to bring in inclusive representation, especially for the global south, especially for the southeast Asia and South Asia, we have to bring in a very proper representation. Thirdly, we have to streamline the bureaucracy and uh, decision making. And finally, we have to bring in financial stability by contributing a lot to the developing countries. So all these are the proposal that has been made through this G4 proposal. So these are all the facts that you have to remember when it comes to UNSC and its decision making process. So far we saw what is this UNSC. It is a very special organ of United Nations. We saw about uh, the membership. There are 15 members, 10 will be non-permanent member and they will be elected every two years and they with and there is a five permanent members. So within this 15 members, the presidency will be rotating every month. So here you might have a doubt why only a month there is a presidency because imagine we have to give a representation to everyone, right? If a particular member is being in the presidency for a longer period of time, then the other member will not get uh, the their turn within the particular time for which they have been elected to this UNSC. That is why the presidency time is very short. Then we saw certain points with respect to voting and decision making and we saw about the reforms that has been taken in the UNSC. So we have a main question for you. You can write an answer in the comment section and post it. Let me read out the question. Discuss the imminent crisis in Myanmar's Rakhine state as highlighted by the United Nations and analyze the underlying causes and potential consequences. So you can write the answer for this question in the comment section and post it. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this explainer article from Indian Express. This article talks about Aligarh Muslim University in short called as AMU. Now the entire article talks about whether minority status should be given to this particular institution or not. So let us revise that from the background in the mains perspective. Before that I have a mains question for you. Let me read out it. Discuss the constitutional provisions related to minority educational institutions in India. You have to write an answer for 150 words for a 10 marker you can post it in the comment section so that we can review your answer so let's firstly start with what is this minority institution and what is the uh, right or what is the protection offered by our indian constitution see this has been dealt with this article 30 it states that the right for minority communities to establish or administer educational institutions so this means that uh, when there is a small community that follows a particular religion it can, it might be any kind of religion not only muslim so any such kind of minority religious uh, people they try to start an institution they have the right to protect their culture linguistic and religion so this is what the objective of this particular article 30 but this right actually applies based on different criteria and conditions when we talk about this AMU that is the Aligarh Muslim University. It was founded in 1877 by Sir Syed Ahmed Khan. See even this might be asked in the preliminary examination. So just make a, make a note of this note. It was uh, founded by Sir Syed Ahmed Khan. It was originally known as Muhammad Anglo Oriental College. So Oriental College it means it actually teaches culture and society of different people. So later this particular Ang Muhammad Anglo Oriental College turned into an university in 1920 through the Aligarh Muslim University Act 1920. Now this was provided because apart from that Muslims should be educated in modern science, humanities and religious studies for socio-economic progress. So for this particular purpose only this Oriental College was converted into an university in 1920. But in order to preserve the cultural and the religious aspect of this particular institution, in 1967, Aziz Basha case was filed. 
in this case supreme court actually denied amu the minority status the supreme court stated that this particular institution was founded by british colonial government and not by the muslim community so it cannot be provided any minority status to this particular institution so this is what the stand in 1967 but later in 1981 this particular act that we saw earlier right aligarh muslim university act 1920 this act was amended in 19 81 and it provided recognition that this particular institution is a minority institution and this is the base or the background behind the ongoing legal bag legal battle regarding this constitutional validity so we shall see what supreme court has done it has taken up a holistic approach so in many cooking shows if you have seen in the televisions when the taste is extraordinary or when the taste is very good the judges what they do is the dish based on the difficulty and the process that has been taken undertaken to make that particular dish so this brings a holistic approach right similarly supreme court has brought in a holistic approach it has considered founding intent it has considered administrative structure how it has functioned historical context and government control over this institution to identify whether this particular institution is a minority institution or not okay is it is as simple as that so for that uh, certain evidences are required there need to be certain clarity on initiator funding sources and community control so this is about the holistic test that has been adopted by our supreme court in this particular case so there are certain arguments for and against for this particular thing so if you see the for argument people say that amu's intent is to uplift the muslim community so it should be provided with the minority rights especially under article 30 which is a fundamental right but certain other critic they say that it is under government control and it can lead to potential discrimination against non muslim students so it can impact india's secular education system entirely so the minority status cannot be given to this particular institution which actually have a legal and statutory backing so this is the argument for and against for this particular thing so so far we saw about amu its background then we saw what is the minority status and the fundamental right under article 30 and then we saw for and against arguments now with these points let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this article this article is written by our prime minister mr narendra modi this article talks entirely about mr ratan tata and his contribution to our entire indian society and and the world so the article actually revolves around this good and corporate governance so let us revise them from the mains perspective in this article discussion before that i have a mains question for you let me read out the question what do you understand by the term governance good governance and ethical governance see this is a previous question so you can write an answer and post it in the comment section we will review your answer now let's start with what is this corporate governance see it is nothing but a system of rule practice and a process where the interest of all the stakeholders will be balanced and there will be a responsible business conduct so the outcome will not only be the profit but also ethical conduct so this is what the corporate governance actually mean so the key regulator of this corporate governance in our uh, country is ministry of corporate affairs and sebi securities exchange board of india now let us quickly go through the key components of corporate governance make note of each point very very important the first thing is accountability see there will be a board of members or the board of directors they will choose the objective of that particular organization they will be accountable within that particular organization if the objective is not have been met so the first important component is accountability secondly inspiration and value uh, we have the ratan tata as a very good example for this particular thing he is a inspirational ethical leader avoiding concentration of wealth complying with the rules and regulations of the government and contributing to the society in the larger picture and taking care care of even the employee 
uh, that they are being recruited. So, the value and inspiration is the second key component of any corporate governance. Thirdly, transparency and disclosure. See, any particular uh, organization, it might be any organization, there must be a transparent decision making and there should be accurate reporting. So, this will reduce the corruption and this will reduce all the shortcomings when there is a transparent decision making and it will enhance the participation of all the people in the organization. So, the third important component is transparency and disclosure. Fourthly, stakeholder rights and uh, relations. So, there must be a fair treatment of all stakeholders irrespective of their status. Even the last tier stakeholder must be treated properly which implies or complies which is the main component of corporate governance. Fifthly, they must follow the ethical and uh, integrity perspective of uh, corporate governance. There should be strong ethical codes and anti-corruption measures. Apart from this, there must be risk management. They should easily identify, assess and manage the risk that is going to come in the future term. This will reduce the loss that, were, that is going to occur on the people that is working in the organization as well as working with the organization and the people who are going to get benefit from this organization. And finally, the patriotism and res resilience. A very good example for this is Tata's ta uh, Taj Hotel comeback after the 26-11 Mumbai terror attack. A lot of uh, hotel management people, they left their life during this 2611 attack so this shows the patriotism and resilience of a particular organization and the people working within the organization so this also must be a key component of corporate governance so make note of all these seven points it is a very important thing when it comes to gs paper 3 now moving on to the regulatory framework in india in india these two important statutory framework is there first one is the Companies Act 2013, second one is the SEBI Regulation 2015. So, this Companies Act 2013 outlines board and director uh, responsibilities. It uh, helps in uh, related party transactions and it even gives protection to the whistleblowers and financial disclosures. And the uh, SEBI Regulation Act 2015, it provides a standardization of disclosure and reporting and it provides for audit and stakeholder committee and it even outlines corporate governance norms that lead to periodic disclosure of finance related document of a particular organization. These two are very important regulatory framework in India. Just make note of it. However, there are certain challenges and issues in corporate governance. Let us go through them one by one. The first thing is the conflict of interest. See, the first issue is conflict of interest. So, there will be two diverged interest, whether to take care of the personal interest or the common good. So, Prioritizing personal good when it comes to corporate governance is a very big issue. A very good example for this is Sahara India where a particular corruption scam, it was not exposed by the stakeholders due to their personal gains. Secondly, lack of independence. See, ineffective board oversight can reduce the compliance not within the organization alone, with the government itself. So, the lack of uh, in independence is a very big challenge. Thirdly, the transparency issue, inadequate financial reporting, a uh, very good example for this is Kingfisher Airlines. This in in inadequate financial reporting not only affects this particular organization, but also the people working with them and also the consumers who are going to get the end benefit of this particular product and the stakeholders who have been invested their money within the organization. Apart from this, the regulatory compliance, the burden on smaller companies is very high and there is also weak enforcement mechanism, especially there is a delay in action and non-compliance when it comes to SEBI regulations. So, these are all certain challenges when it comes to corporate governance. So, so far we saw what is a corporate governance, then we saw some of the components of corporate governance, then we saw regulatory framework when it comes to corporate governance and finally we saw the challenges and issues when it comes to corporate governance so with this we came to the end of the news article discussion if you like the video hit like do comment and don't forget to subscribe to shankar IAS academy youtube channel now thank you so much for listening